Let's see. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. It's another Friday, and we are so grateful to our AIHM community. Happy to welcome you here today. And it is uh, my pleasure today to um, introduce to you Dr. Donna Ayudi, who is here to share her knowledge with you about um, sun protection. And we're um, this is our, a little information about the Academy, if you're, if you're new and just joining us. And our, our, as I mentioned, our special guest today, Dr. Donna Ayudi. Um, several different um, accolades to mention here. She's a board certified dermatologist. Um, she's done several different things, an assistant professor at UConn Department of Dermatology. She's a clinical instructor at the University of New England Family Practice Residency. Um, she's worked in Haiti, Mexico, and Tanzania, among um, several other, other things. And um, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to, to Donna. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And I'll let you uh, take it away. Okay, great. Welcome. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, sun protection in, uh, uh, in, and prevention of skin cancers. Um, I practice dermatology here in uh, the Northeast. Uh, I've been practiced for about 25 years now. And uh, a good part of my practice is the care of patients with uh, sun damage as well as skin cancers. So I spend a good part of my day discussing uh, ways of protecting the, uh, the skin from the sun. Uh, as you may know, uh, humans have co-evolved with the sun and so the sun does have some beneficial, um, beneficial effects. Uh, it aids in the production of vitamin D, which we don't normally get in sufficient amounts through our diet. Uh, vitamin D is important in immune regulation. Um, it's important in calcium metabolism, bone metabolism, as well as a whole host of other uh, aspects. Uh, vitamin D is probably more of a of a hormone uh, rather than a true vitamin. Um, if we don't get vitamin D through the sun, uh, through conversion uh, of the active form through the sun, uh, we need to take it either in a supplement form um, or in uh, fortified foods such as uh, milk, some of our juices, breads, and cereal. Um, this is particularly important in the Northeast where we have long dark winters and uh, in patients who have darker uh, skin uh, tones. Uh, so in addition, uh, the sun provides us with a lot of other benefits. It, it can be a mood booster, it makes us feel better. But um, just this week alone, I diagnosed uh, three or four different melanomas. Uh, most of them thankfully were superficial and in situ. Um, and I, but I spend much of my time taking care of basal cell skin cancers, squamous cell skin cancers. And so we know that too much sun uh, can have deleterious effects. Uh, the radiation that we receive through sunlight is something called ionizing radiation. So what that does is it can cause damage in our DNA. Uh, when our DNA is damaged in the wrong parts. It can lead to uh, problems with DNA repair. It can lead to problems with tumor modulation and uh, can lead to the development of skin cancers. We don't know how many uh, hits on the DNA it will take to cause a skin cancer. Uh, and many people have genetic uh, predispositions to uh, be unable to repair DNA. So while we have to learn to live with the sun and, and its many benefits, we have to learn how to protect ourselves from the sun as well. Um, I personally believe in moderation as far as it comes into the sun. I do try to get a little bit of sun on my morning walk, uh, whether it's uh, 10 to 15 minutes of, of uh, unexposed sun on the uh, hands and, and face. But when I go out for longer rides, bike rides, golf, uh, I tend to uh, try to avoid the peak uh, hours of sun between 10 and two. Uh, I will wear protective clothing, uh, a hat, 
Um, there are certain types of, uh, of clothing now that have uh, ultraviolet protection built right into it, uh, and it is uh, often labeled on, on the clothing. Um, one brand that I particularly like is something called Sun Precautions. The material is very lightweight, and uh, you can order their products either through a catalog uh, or online. Um, in addition, I, uh, I will recommend a sunscreen that has e some sort of a physical blocker, either um, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide or a mixture of the two. Uh, this is because most of the damaging rays from the sunlight come in the UVA range. And many of our chemical sunblocks do not give us adequate protection in this UVA range. Um, the problem with some of these physical blockers are that they can be uh, quite thick and cosmetically, sometimes cosmetically unappealing. Uh, so they are available in micronized forms. Um, I oftentimes will combine a, a, chem, a physical blocker with a chemical blocker uh, to get the most uh, protection. But we do have to be careful because some of these chemical blockers are uh, endocrine disruptors and um, can also be hazardous to the environment. Uh, in particular, there's uh, one called oxybenzone, which is up in up to 65% of chemical sunscreens in the in the United States, and uh, that is uh, one that I tend to tell people to uh, avoid. Um, when making recommendations to people, I will oftentimes recommend going to the Environmental Working Group, uh, which provides an annual ranking of their recommendations for sunscreen um, and will give us safe recommendations for uh, sunscreen use. Um, basically, how sunscreens work, physical, physical blockers actually reflect the sun. Uh, they're particulates, and so when the sun's uh, energy or rays hit these physical blockers, they reflect back out into the environment. Uh, chemical sunscreens uh, are uh, of a composition that they actually absorb the sun's energy and are converted in the process, thereby minimizing the penetration of these, this energy into the skin and deeper into the skin, um, uh, it, preventing its uh, effect on the cellular and subcellular uh, levels. Um, orally, there are a couple of supplements which I oftentimes will recommend. Um, one supplement is something that's been around for a couple of years. It's called Polypodium leucomoides or PLE. It is derived from a tropical fern plant that is in both Central and South America. Uh, Polypoides uh, locomoides is an antioxidant and it picks up some of these, some of the free radicals which are uh, induced when sun is absorbed uh, by the cells in the skin. Um, by, uh, by doing this, it actually will uh, prevent the appearance of damaged cells. We can look at this under the microscope. Uh, it's also helpful in people who have photosensitive dermatoses, uh, such as uh, polymorphous light eruption or other um, sun allergies, uh, photo allergies due to drug, um, other types of sun, uh, sun, sun, um, sun sensitivities. Um, another supplement which has been useful in, in, in skin cancer prevention is uh, niacinamide or niacin, which are uh, vitamin B3. Um, both the, the niacinamide also uh, enhances the repair of DNA damage uh, induced by sun exposure. It's given as a dose of 500 milligrams a day. And for many of my patients with uh, extensive sun damage, as well as um, multiple skin cancers, I will recommend supplementation with niacinamide or nicotinamide, uh, as well as possibly the polypoides uh, leuco uh, leucomotus. Um, as far as um, anything else is concerned, um, as we discussed, vitamin D is, is something that if we are going to protect our skin from the sun,
that we will need to, um, to supplement. Um, again, I had, as I had discussed, uh, it, it is uh, a, an, a vitamin that is important in uh, various um, physiologic mechanisms such as uh, bone metabolism, immune regulation, endocrine regulation. Um, deficiency states in vitamin D have been implicated in osteoporosis, uh, various types of cancer, um, autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and diabetes. So current recommendations for the daily intake of vitamin D are uh, 600 units for children, uh, 800 units for adults, and many experts will call for higher doses in um, high-risk groups. Um, as I had mentioned before, the amount of sunlight that is necessary for vitamin D production in, uh, in uh, most light-skinned peoples would be at least 15 minutes a day, a few times a week to arms and face. Uh, for darker skin people, the requirements uh, uh, that, that we would have to get from the direct sunlight uh, would have to be increased to uh, up to sometimes two hours a day. So um, particularly in darker climates, uh, patients with darker skin uh, should be supplementing their uh, vitamin D as well. Um, Let's see, anything else? Um, I don't know if, uh, at, at this point, I don't know if anybody has any questions or would like to. Um... There are a couple of questions here and it's actually about vitamin D. Lena is asking, is there an upper limit to vitamin D levels we should be worried about? And if so, what could be the side effects of excess vitamin D? And, um, and then if someone is out in the sun a lot, should we lower the vitamin D supplement dose they are taking and what le levels do you like patients to have? I'm really not as involved in the testing for vitamin D levels. Um, I, I, I leave that up to the primary care doctor and the endocrinologist. But yes, I do think that vitamin, there can be things such as vitamin D, if uh, toxicity. Um, if people are taking uh, the doses that uh, I would recommend, these lower doses, I don't think we're in danger of, do, of, of um, inducing any toxicity with vitamin D. I think that would be in, in doses that were, are much, much higher. Okay, great. And then another question here from Rashida. She's a pediatrician in San Jose. And she says that she finds a lot of kids are sensitive to sunblocks, especially those with eczema. Is there any particular one that you'd recommend for sensitive skin in babies? And do you maybe have a recipe if you make your own? I tend to find that again the the, the um, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide um, based sunscreens, the chemical free sunscreens, are much better tolerated. Although they can be quite drying, and so um, adding a moisturizer sometimes underneath and making sure that moisturization occurs um, after after applying them um, is is possible. I don't tend to make my own sunscreens particularly with, with the particulates, because I find that there's uneven dispersion of the zinc oxide and the titanium dioxide particles. Uh, so you can end up getting hot spots. Okay. And what is the risk to dark skinned people for skin cancer is another question we have here from Christy. Dark skin, uh, pay, uh, basically people with darker skin types have a natural SPF of probably between eight and 10. So their risk of uh, non-melanoma type skin cancers is, is much less. Um, it's not unheard of. Uh, melanoma is probably the thing that can happen. And particularly uh, melanoma occurs in areas where there's less pigmentation, say the palms, the soles, the nail beds um, of darker skin patients. But I have seen basal cell skin cancers in um, many of my Hispanic patients and as well as uh, African-American skin types, types uh, four and even five. So they can develop, but they are much, much, much less. You know, the majority of my patients with, um, with basal cell skin cancer, squamous cell skin cancer, actinic keratosis, are people who have skin types one, two, um, so your your lighter skin types with lighter color hair, light colored eyes. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and any special protection for patients 60 years plus? As far um, as, um, type, as types of, uh, as types of skin care, of uh, sunscreens? Yeah, or any, any special advice for patients that are older, perhaps, or, or any special protection types? Well, uh, people who are older, I think, are at more risk for developing both benign as well as malignant uh, tumors of the skin. So protecting the skin, I think, is even more important in those groups. I think it's uh, a factor of both um, you know, prolonged years of sun exposure that puts people at risk, um, as well as just decreased immune surveillance. Um, other patient groups that are at higher risk and should be much more careful for protecting their skin would be um, patients who have undergone uh, transplantation, patients who are on immunosuppressant medication, um, as well as patients with a history of certain types of blood cancers like lymphomas, leukemias. Um, I see as things like CLL progress, the risk of, of squamous cells goes up dramatically. And these skin cancers can appear very rapidly and become aggressive very, very quickly. So for those people, I really try to tell them to really strictly avoid the sun as much as possible, uh, wear protective clothing, wear hats, um, and in those patients probably choose the higher SPF of, you know, close to 100. Um, as far as choosing uh, at SPF levels, you know, the SPF measures the protection for ultraviolet B, which is a form of uh, one, of the, one of the wavelengths. Um, it doesn't really give, we don't really have a good standardized measure for ultraviolet A. Um, so an SPF of 15 probably blocks about 95 to 96% of ultraviolet B rays. Going up to SPF of 30, blocks perhaps 98 to 99%. So as far as your UVB protection, going much higher than 30 is probably not necessary. Where I find it to be helpful is if, you, um, is if, if you're going to be out for a prolonged period of time. So if you're gonna be out all day in a tense sun, I find that adding that extra SPF of 50, 70, 100 is helpful. Um, and it does seem to decrease the amount of time in between which you, sh you, you need to reapply. So if you're using an SPF of 30, you know, that's 30 times the, num the amount of time that it would take for you to burn. So if you were to get a sunburn in say 10 minutes, an SPF of 30 would prolong that 30 times. So that would be, you know, a couple of hours. If, if you're using a higher SPF, it will prolong that time even longer. Um, but the chemical blockers, like I said, had said before, they provide um, a very broad spectrum. So they get both the UVA and the UVB rays. And it seems as if UVA is more, uh, more of a risk factor for melanoma because it does penetrate into the skin deeper and it does affect, um, the immune response to the sun. Um, in addition, for most patients with photosensitive dermatitis or problems like um, lupus or polymorphous light eruption or drug, photo drug reactions, UVA is also implicated in that. And for those patients, I recommend clothing, physical blockers, and sun avoidance as much as possible. Okay, great. Thank you for that question, Erica. And um, it looks like Rashida is following up and saying uh, polypodium leukotomos. She's asking about dosing for both adults and kids. That I would have to refer you to the to the actual. It's it's usually a two capsules, I believe, a day during the sun exposed areas. But I would have to refer you to the um, to the to the um, to the manufacturer. I don't know of its use in children. I'm not sure that I I, I would recommend it. In children, for children, I really do recommend um, just sun, you know, sun avoidance, protective clothing, and you know, just your your chemical-free sunblocks. I don't know that we really know the dosing or you know its use in in young children as of yet as a as an herbal remedy. Okay, and another question coming in from Lena. Someone said coconut oil protects against sun damage. And do you have any thoughts or? Um, experience with that? 
I, I, I really don't, in terms of, I don't think it's like a, it's, it's a good sunblock, whether it actually has any antioxidants in it that act as um, a sun protectant, I'm really not sure. Um, I think as a moisturizer, it's probably one of the better moisturizers and can help in patients with uh, sun damage and, and dryness due to chronically sun damaged skin. But um, I'm not aware of a large amount of evidence that points to it being um, beneficial in prevention of, of, of sun um, related damage. Okay. And um, that makes me think of another question, which is maybe uh, around diet. Do you have things that you recommend people eat that supports, you know, vitamin D or a way to eat and keeps your skin healthy and protected? Well, as far as diet is concerned, uh, again, um, for m m many of our foods are fortified with vitamin D. So the vitamin D in, in, in our milk and um, in our fortified breads, it's, a, it's also present in the oily fish as well as the cod liver oil. And it's present in green leafy vegetables, the darker green leafy vegetables. But my uh, impression is, is that the amount that you would have to eat from those sources would probably not be sufficient uh, to give you enough of vitamin D. Um, other diets, I mean, they've done a lot of studies looking at various um, micronutrients um, vitamin A. Uh, I don't think that anybody ever found any, any difference in terms of skin cancer prevention using vitamin A. But the uh, nicotinamide or niacinamide, I think there's pretty good evidence. Um, and we are starting to recommend supplementation with the, with the niacinamide for our high, higher risk patients, especially okay. during the summer months. Excellent. Um, there's no other current questions in the Q&A feature. So I don't know if there's um, other topics that you wanted to cover? Um, I can't really think of anything. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if there's any more questions. We're, we're happy to receive them. Oh, here's another one. So Lena it says, I may have missed it, but the, the polypodium lupitomus, what was the, oh, the dosing in the groups recommended for again? She's just asking it. And I don't know if you can remind her of what you said there. Oh, no, I was just saying that I probably wouldn't recommend it for children. Let me see if I can find the actual dosing of that. And while um, Donna's looking, if there are any other questions, we're welcome to have them. Um, and, and Lena is following up too with another question about um, you know, where you would get it from, reliable brands and sources and costs that are associated with that. It's called HelioCare. HelioCare is the brand name of it. Um, that's the only brand, that's the only one that I really know of. Uh, It's 1999, and um, oh, it's, it, actually, it's interesting. It actually has the nicotinamide in it now. Uh, I was not even aware of that. Um, but I'm looking at the the dosing. It's two capsules daily, and I do believe that it's it really is only for uh, adults. And Walgreens is. It's showing up on the Walgreens website. We, I know we sell it through our office. I know you can get it through Amazon. So the, it, it's the HelioCare Advanced. I don't know, you probably can't see it on my thing, but it's a yellow and black uh, package. Um, so, I, so the nice thing is, is that taking that, uh, the HelioCare Plus does seem to minimize the number of tablets that you have to take and, and gives you both the nicotinamide as well as the polypoid polypodium leucomoides. Yes, and Samantha is, is following up with, do you dose that uh, prior to or after sun exposure? I take it, I tell people to take it during the period of time that they're going to be exposed in the sun. So it would be a daily, it would be a daily supplement. And for people who are, who work outdoors, I would say they could take it every day. Uh, for people who are going to be on vacation, you know, perhaps start it a week ahead of time and take it throughout the period of time. Um, my sense is that as it's an antioxidant, it works while it's on board. So you would need to take it 
during the time of sun exposure. Okay. And how about um, on an empty stomach or does that matter? I believe you can just take it, you know, I don't think there are any specific uh, indications for with food or on an empty stomach. Okay. And um, how about treatment? Erica has a question here. How about treatment yeah. of skin damage due to sun? How do you treat that? Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it, for the most part, it depends on what you're looking at. If, if we're looking at people who have extensive actinic damage due to um, precancerous changes, uh, we would use various modalities to try to treat that. Um, some of them are, um, are, are like a chemotherapy, like uh, topical 5-fluorouracil applied as a cream once to twice daily um, for two to four weeks until you get the reaction. Um, there, uh, there's also something that's called a, a blue light, which we will use um, uh, with sensitizers that also help uh, treat any uh, precancerous actinic uh, keratoses. Um, there are also other, several other, other topical uh, chemo agents for that. Uh, for appearance uh, wise, uh, what we will oftentimes do are uh, a series of chemical peels. Um, if the damage is deep, uh, a deeper TCA or trichloroacetic acid peel could be used. If it's more superficial, um, we could do a series of glycolic acid peels. Um, we do intense pulse light to get rid of the um, telangiectasias and red and lentiginous changes that occur in the skin. Um, Retin-A topically or retinol or derivatives of vitamin A can be used. Uh, we also uh, in the morning recommend sometimes the use of antioxidants such as vitamin C, vitamin uh, A, uh, sometimes the green tea extracts, anything that has an antioxidant in it can be used to help prevent sun damage. And actually niacinamide can be used topically as well. And it's a good, uh, it provides a good barrier to uh, transepidermal wa water loss, uh, as well as acting as a antioxidant and aiding in DNA repair. Excellent. And uh, a follow-up to that, and make, I hope you didn't mention this, but if you just got the sunburn and you want to make sure it doesn't have a lasting effect, what do, what do you do that day or within the week? That's coming from Lena. Um, basically, uh, I, I, I will usually tell people, I, I'm not sure that there's anything that you can do to prevent any damage kind of once it's done, but you really kind of want to get the, get the heat out of the skin. So you want to do cool compresses. You could use things like aloe to kind of cool down the skin. Um, oral um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, anti can be used. You could take um, uh, say two to 600 milligrams of Advil um, and that can oftentimes prevent that acute sunburn um, reaction uh, from, from progressing. But oftentimes it's kind of cooling down the skin. Again, I'm not sure, once that happens, I'm not sure there's much you can do to sort of prevent damage, um, whether an antioxidant would help. I, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know if there's any, any evidence that anything uh, of that is, is helpful. Preventing the sunburn is kind of most important, I think. Okay, uh, thank you. And so uh, we are at, there's a question from Sally. What was the type of clothing that you suggested, if you can? Um, uh, I like, there's, there's, a, there's a brand called Salombra, S-O-L-U-M-B-R-A. And it was, uh, it, it, it was, the clothing line was manufactured by a man who had melanoma. And it's just a very, very light, um, a very, very light, breathable material that I have found uh, to be very comfortable when I'm out in the sun. So, so many of the other um, clothing oftentimes feels heavy or oppressive, but this really is a nice, a nice brand that uh, allows the skin to, to breathe. Okay, and I think um, Lena's asking how you spell that again. Um, uh, S-O-L-U-M-B-R-A. And they have nice hats, nice zipper up jackets. Okay, and that has UV protection, you said. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. And um, do you have any suggestions on something folks can do without a dermatologist or things that you recommend that they do on their own? Coming, another question coming from Lena. She's got lots of questions. It's great. Thank you. Oh, that is good. Uh, like, like in terms of what? For beach sun umbrellas. Oh, wait, that's a different question. Um, it, Umbr sun umbrellas are wonderful. <laughs> Anything that you can do to sort of... And are there ones with UV protection? Or there something? are. There are. Working. And those tend to be rated, rated as well. Um, I think that they're, they're uh, rated under a scale called UPF rather than uh, SPF. And they're rated up to 50 to 100 plus. So definitely look for an umbrella that has a UPF rating. I, somebody, uh, one of my friends was telling me a story that they had bought a an umbrella kind of at a discount place and put it up at the beach and it did not have UPF rating and they all burned. So there is a seal that does, uh, does tell you what that, what that rating is. Excellent. That makes, makes a difference. Okay. Great. Um, and I think there's a question that is off topic and about lichen planus. Uh, I don't have treatments for lichen planus. I don't know if we want to go completely off topic with that right now. If there are any other questions about um, sun protection uh, or anything, we welcome those. Unless you wanted to mention something about that, <laughs> that's up to you. <laughs> Maybe not now. Um, do you have any opinions about Maui Babe after sun lotion? It has aloe vera, but has cetyl alcohol. So are, are, do you have any thoughts on that from an anonymous attendee that we have? I have no experience with that. Um, you know, it, the cetyl alcohol doesn't, just because something has is an alcohol doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be drying. There are, there are certainly alcohol-based compounds that are actually you know, lubricating. So I don't, if it, it I guess if it feels good, it, it, I don't think that that as an ingredient would deter me from its use. Okay, excellent. And then uh, timing to avoid is uh, 10 to two or maybe 10 to four if- 10 to four, and I, I will say that lately I do feel that even going out after hours, like even going out after work, if I go out, say four to five, I have to be really careful because I, I, you, you can still get a burn. That sun is still really strong at that time of day, particularly in different parts of the country. Right, I'm sure that depends on where you are geographically and-, and The time of year and the time yeah. of day and everything, yes. Of course. And, uh, and uh, Lena saying in regards to avoiding the sun, I just found out that I can get burned in the shade too. Mm -hmm. um, is that, that's true, huh? It is, uh, mm -hmm. because the sun's rays are reflected off of many surfaces. So, you know, particularly if you're at the ocean, those suns, so the rays will be reflected from the uh, water, they will be reflected from the sand, um, concrete pavement. Uh, so yes, you still get, you still get sun when you're in, in the shade. Mm -hmm. It's not just a direct hit. Right, it bounces off all kinds of things. Okay, and um, so should we just not be on the beach at all from 10 to four then? Well, I mean, it depends on the time of year and your skin type and probably how sensitive you are, but would you agree, um, Donna? That, that you shouldn't be on the beach during the, the beach at all from 10 to 4 yeah <laughs> i don't know if i should definitely say that i think i think again i think moderation is key you know I'm, I'm sure all of us like to take a little break and go to the beach or go to our nice tropical locations after a long uh cold winter here um i when i when i go to the beach i put an umbrella up i put my sunscreen on I wear, I, I'll put on a long sleeve shirt. If I go swimming for any period of time, I'll wear a, you know, a, a UPF uh, rated shirt in the water. Um, I mean, I play golf. I do all of these things. I ride my bike. I, I don't think we have to be like hermits, really. I mean, I know some dermatologists are really sticklers about this, but I... I think it's 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 a lot of good common sense, really. You know, and, and for our younger children, I think 
probably staying, keeping them out of the sun for those hours is important. And, and not only from a sunburn perspective, but just from the heat and general health perspective. The young, young children probably shouldn't be out there. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, Lane is also asking about protecting our eyes, which may or not be, you know, in your area, but can't sunlight promote cataracts? Um, Absolutely, can promote cat cataracts, macular de degeneration. There's ocular melanomas, uh, which are actually on the rise. So, so yes, absolutely, we do have to uh, wear uh, appropriate you you uh, ultraviolet protecting uh, lenses. There may be contact lenses that have that kind of protection, or do you know? There, about there are some contact lenses that do have uh, built-in UV protection. But again, that's that's it's important to make sure that they're rated as well because. Um, wearing a, a, a darker lens that doesn't have protection can actually harm us because you know, it, it allows the pupil to dilate more and allows more light to penetrate into the eye. So you have to have specific UV blockers within the lenses. I think most sunglasses that are sold in the United States have a rating, um, but there may be some you know, less expensive versions that don't. So be wary of that. Okay. Excellent. Wow, we've got a lot of questions in, and it looks like you. No, I'm glad too. <laughs> oh, that's great that we were able to, um, you know, really interact and, and get a lot of those clarified. Uh, we appreciate that very much. Um, Do people feel like that there are any other things that I might not have mentioned, either answering questions or. Yeah, if anything else comes in, or if you want to mention if people want to get in contact with you or find out more about you, is there a website? I can write that in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at Dermatology Associates of Eastern Connecticut, and I'm in um, Glastonbury. And uh, I think it's www.glastonburyderm.com. Okay. okay, excellent. And um, oh, it looks like what skin conditions can sunlight help treat and what would you what would you recommend about dosing of sun? So is there actually skin conditions that the sun would help? Uh, yes, actually there are. Um, one of the big skin conditions that we uh, often use uh, sunlight in is, is psoriasis. Uh, uh, psoriasis is very, very responsive to ultraviolet light. And before a lot of the biologic um, medications, the explosion of biologic medications for psoriasis, we used uh, ultraviolet light as a first line treatment um, for psoriasis. Um, atopic dermatitis, it's less clear. Um, it helps sometimes because of its anti-inflammatory properties. And I do have some children in whom I will use uh, ultraviolet light uh, for atopic dermatitis, particularly since there still are not great systemic meds that are FDA approved for, uh, for children for atopic dermatitis, but there are, they are coming down the pike and, and we are getting approval for um, a number of things down the pipeline. So that's exciting. Um, we use uh, ultraviolet light in the treatment of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. Um, somebody had mentioned lichen planus. Some people will use a form of ultraviolet light called uh, PUVA, which is an uh, addition of a medication called Sorolens to enhance um, UVA light. Um, and so vitiligo, we use vitiligo, uh, treatment of uh, vitiligo with uh, narrowband UVB and uh, more targeted light therapies. Um, so yeah, there are plenty of things. As far as getting natural sunlight, um, it's so variable. I mean, up here in my part, my neck of the woods, it's hard to recommend natural sunlight for treatment of a lot of dermatoses because you just don't always have reliable sunlight for a good part of the year. Um, plus, when I treat patients with narrow band UVB, um, narrow band UVB is limited to a wavelength of about 311 nanometers. So it is a single, it's single wavelength or a very small cluster of wavelengths that have been shown to have greatest therapeutic effect 
with uh, the, the least amount of um, toxicity as far as skin cancers are concerned. Um, some people will go into tanning booths. Tanning booths are UVA. They tend to be a different wavelength of light. They may help some of our patients uh, with atopic dermatitis. I find they're not that helpful for many of my patients with psoriasis because as people get progressively more tan, the light does not work as well to clear their, uh, their problem. Okay, interesting. And do you, how about tanning beds? What are, what are your thoughts in general on the use of them or are there different kinds or what are your thoughts on that? I'm really not a big fan of tanning beds. Uh, I would say within the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen an explosion of young women with multiple melanomas um, by the time they're like 30 or 40. And these are people who don't have a strong family history, but they're almost all in tanners. Mm -hmm. So um, I, 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 I'm finding less and less of my patients are using uh, artificial tanning. And I just think, you know, I, I caution against the use of, of, um, of artificial uh, tanning booths. Excellent. And um, what do you think the increase in cancer rate is from problems with the ozone layer or contaminated diet and earth in general? Or any thoughts on just kind of our, the general increase? Pattern? I think there is, there probably is uh, an increased potency due to uh, depletion of ozone. Um, I do personally feel that the sun's rays are a lot stronger. Um, I think a lot have to do with lifestyle issues though as well and people, you know, vacationing more to tropical areas, just spending more time uh, outdoors in the sun. Um, in melanoma, the risk seems to be particularly people who have intermittent exposure, so like the weekend warriors. So people who actually develop a tan may have some level of protection from that tan, uh, whereas people who go out and get a lot of exposure without um, some level of protection may be at higher risk for the penetration of UVA deeper into the skin and development of melanoma. Excellent, okay. And then um, non-skin or diet related ways to prevent skin cancer, like amount of sleep you recommend or uh, doesn't sleep help us repair the skin? Um, and that's also coming from Lena. Lots of good questions from Lena. Thank you. I mean, I think that probably a good healthy diet, I think that um, good hydration, a uh, good amount of sleep. I, I can't think that it doesn't really help the appearance of the skin as well as our body's ability to um, fight off, you know, skin cancers, precancers, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think as part of the whole picture, I think, um, you know, just good, healthy lifestyle uh, is important. Right, that's a, a very good point. I mean, smoking is one of those things I think that does enhance uh, sun damage. Um, we see uh, huge amounts of, uh, of photo aging in people who are smokers as well as people who have had sun exposure. Um, I tend to see a tip in uh, in favor of more squamous cell skin cancers developing in smokers too. So there must be something about, you know, the cigarette smoke that uh, lends more towards uh, squamous cells over basal cells. Mm -hmm. And that's the other interesting thing. And I don't know if it's due to an eight, my own practice being an aging population uh, or something else, but I am seeing a huge shift from basal cell skin cancers to more squamous cell skin cancers. And it may have to do with age, chronic immunosuppression, um, duration of sun exposure. Um, but those skin cancers can be quite aggressive. I've seen several, several very aggressive squamous cells within the last couple of uh, weeks to months, very rapidly growing, very, very dangerous. Okay. Um, and are there mistakes that primary care doctors make that you wish we knew to avoid to detect skin cancers maybe earlier on or any, any, any tips or suggestions to primary care docs? You know? I, I mean, I, I, would, I would love it if, if, if every primary care doc or provider just sort of took a 
couple of minutes to just look over the entire skin. Um, I know you have a lot of different things that you've got to focus on. And so uh, for that reason, a lot of primary care providers just refer people in to see me for their annual skin check. I would say um, scalp is an area that's easily missed and um, educating actually hair uh, barbers and uh, hairstylists, I think is mm -hmm. almost a better means of primary detection in that group because I, the highest risk melanomas that I've seen um, have been melanomas in the scalp because they're detected at such a late, um, late stage. If you're looking at distribution, I mean, certainly the majority of our skin cancers due to the sun are in sun exposed areas like the face, the neck, the hands. So those would be areas to particularly pay attention to. Uh, an area that tends to be missed is behind the ears. You know, people don't always look behind the ears, especially if, you know, they have uh, hair covering that. So a quick peek behind the ears as you're, you know, checking someone's thyroid or doing something, you know, might be uh, something that you could look at. I always pay attention to feet because I feel like the bottoms of the feet and between the toes is another neglected area. Um, right. And, that's and then I guess just, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. The primary care people around me tend to be pretty good, both at referrals as well as, you know, many of them are doing a pretty good thorough job at, of at least looking at people's backs, looking at people's skin as part of their uh, entire physical. And um, many of them have on their checklist of, of health maintenance to, to see a dermatologist if, if, if a person has a lot of um, nevi or, or um, sun damage. And, and should uh, children have those annual derm exams too? Uh, I don't really think that that's necessary unless, if there's a family history, if there are a lot of nevi, if there's a regular nevi, large congenital nevi, but the risk of melanoma above puberty is very, very, very low. So I think screening in that population, we just don't have the resources to do it. And I think it's a pretty low yield um, proposition. And um, how about your opinions on powder sunscreen for the scalp? Have you heard about those or have any opinions on that? I have not. Um, I will oftentimes recommend a spray sunscreen for the scalp mm -hmm. and then use of hats because I just find that uh, with any of those things, I think it's just very, very hard to get uniform application uh, into the hair. And um, back to um, the annual screenings, at what age do you recommend to start referring for those annual screenings? You know, none, nobody really has great guidelines. And again, in, especially in certain areas like ours, it, the resources are just not there for us to do skin checks on every single person. I mean, probably by the time you're say 40, a, a good baseline exam isn't a bad idea. Um, but again, you have to kind of look at risk stratification. If you see somebody who has a lot of sun damage, then I mean, I see basal cells in people in their 20s. We see melanomas in people that are, are younger. But as far as routine screening, it would, it would be nice if we could have a way of, of risk stratifying patients and referring them over, um, you know, based on, on uh, skin cancer risk and um, which again, it might be somebody who has a lot of nevi. It might be somebody who has a strong family history. It might be just somebody who you look at and they have just a lot of sun damage. And then certainly all of my patients with basal cells get examined once a year. Um, my patients with extensive actinic keratosis get examined once a year. Um, Melanoma patients, well, depending on the depth and risk, might be twice a year. It might be a couple times a year. Patients with underlying immunosuppression, um, uh, again, my, my uh, lymphoma patients, CLL patients, um, patients on chronic immunosuppression, transplant patients, they, they're seen multiple times a year. Okay. And another great question here from Erica. Patients that take antibiotics should not be in direct sunlight. So how many days after finishing the med medication can they go out to the direct sun again? 
It, it, it depends on what antibiotic you're talking about. Are you talking about the tetracyclines, which can be photosensitizing, or the quinolones, uh, uh, which can be photosensitizing? How long does it last in the skin? I mean, I, I could, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I certainly would tell people to avoid the sun while they're on them, and maybe a week or two later. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know how much of it gets actually deposited in the skin versus how much of it is really based on when the antibiotic is on board. Okay. Well, that looks like we got uh, all the questions covered. There's no more coming in. Lots of good questions here, about 34 answered, which is exciting to see. And I see um, Rashida was kind enough to share the link um, to everyone in the chat. Thank you, Rashida, for doing that. And um, yeah, I, I thank you so much for, for joining us today and just Rapid fire questions came right at you and you were, you know, taking care of them left and right. Thank you. So I was much. really happy to have the questions because I honestly, this is the first webinar I've done and I didn't know if I was supposed to prepare a PowerPoint or what yeah, the format I was. And so, uh, you know, to have guidelines as to what people were really interested in and I yeah, think and I think, yeah, really it really does help for us to be able to ask, like have people ask who's listening and what kind of questions are really pressing and what do we, what do we want to know? So I, I like the dialogue part of it. I think that's really, really helpful. I agree. Thank you so much um, for, for your time and for your wisdom and uh, patience with all of those questions. We really appreciate it. Okay. And I'm going to quickly just share um, once more here. Um, to remind everyone about remembering to keep our integrative community connected. That's um, really important to us. And um, we want to remind you our, our annual conference is, is coming up um, in October, October 9th to the 11th. And you can find out more information on our website. And these are all the different ways that you can stay in contact with us and we just are so grateful to our to our whole community and we're really grateful to you Donna today for joining us. So everyone have a great rest of your weekend and take good care. Okay, thank you very much. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye-bye.